I'm not sorry, not say you, uh, you know, you encourage them straight away to, uh, you know, dismantle their other uh, uh, processes. But if they first of all start to see this normal in the context they're talking about, they can see that this is an unconscious process. They can see that that's how they survive. They can see that, you know, they can move to some compassion and a different narrative. They might be able to see there's different ways of actually handling the situation or at least understand the connection between the two. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the the, the actual clue for me is in the title, the un unconscious defences, bringing it into a client's awareness that we all have defences. That is like you say from the moment we're born, you know, we're trying to not be vulnerable and, you know, live and survive. So it's, it's you know, we all have defences of, of one form or another and understanding that that's part of us and being aware of it, for me, is the first step to then, like you say, not dismantle it completely, but to just understand that it's 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 okay and it's normal to have them. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, episode 76 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with myself and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. We'll go back to that one. And in this episode, <laughs> we're going to be talking about the understanding... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you carry on. We're talking about what? The understanding of unconscious defences in therapy. Oh, God, that's, this is such a wonderful subject because it's basically, without this, therapy won't happen. Yeah. Really, seriously. Yeah. Well, yeah. it may happen, but you won't, know, you won't be able to talk about what you did and what it was about to understand <laughs> therapy in the first place. So it's a, a wonderful subject, I think. It is, and we all we all have defenses, and most of them are unconscious ones. <laughs> well, of course, when if we go back to the birth of the human organism, and of course the um, beginning of the psychological journey, um, by definition, from the time we came out of the womb and we're coming into this world, we're defending against vulnerability and trauma. Yeah, and those natural psychological defences um, are. I can, should we list some of them? You go for it, Bob. Well, it's quite a lot, but we'll start off with you know things which, <laughs> without these defence systems, uh, would leave us in a sorry state. I think so. But let's start listing some of them. Denial. Yeah. So this is a very important, necessary, but in terms of psychological survival. Um, I know there's a whole unconscious process to this post to this I'm talking about, but without denial, we are we're often left so vulnerable to the harshness of the actual reality around us. Yeah. So, I was just thinking that about oh, I could pick many things about um let's just pick the Ukraine Russia war, which uh we're caught a, in observing at the moment. So you think about denial of a lot of those people on the ground in Ukraine and Russia who have to denial deny a lot of existence. And a lot of trauma to be able to continue. Yeah. And people that come back from post traumatic situations, whether it be Afghanistan or whatever we're talking about, um, to get by the most traumatic situations have to deny many things. Yeah. As, and exactly like you say, it's a defense mechanism. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We see it all the time. Yeah. You'll see it in your therapy room every day. Yeah. 
the denial of the vulnerability. Usually, it's the denial of their vulnerability. Which in, you know, trauma is really important. Yeah, and just generally in relationships. Yeah. I mean, if we go even farther afield in climate change or we could talk about many things, I think, but people will deny things um, so that they can survive in yeah. a soothing way or a way which um, vulnerability doesn't come into their question. Yeah. And we're all really good at sticking our head in the sand when we need to. Yeah, so... I was, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we could go on about many situations. And denial is a very important, natural, unconscious defense to be able to create stability, uh, continuity, predictability for ourselves in a psychological way. Yeah. Or manner. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, Does denial link in with um, discounting? I don't know if that's an unconscious defense system, is it? Um, when we discount somebody, we probably might do that. Yes, I suppose it can link into it. What were you thinking about in when you asked that question? Well, it, I, I'm not sure whether it links into the vulnerability or not, but di discounting the severity of certain things, which, mm. you know, is, is kind of the same as denial, I suppose. Yeah, so we've got dis discounting the existence of actual actions, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Denial of the significance of actions, thoughts, and feelings. So we have different levels of discounting, which to me really are, in many ways, different levels of denial. Yeah. And I know in TA they talk about four levels of discounting, you know, significance of existence existence of issues and i can't quite remember them all but they can easily be thought of in terms of different levels of denial yeah another unconscious defense system which we all do by the way is dissociation mm. uh, dissociation or definition of dissociation is a movement away from the self and you often people often describe it maybe i've zoned out yeah or, or i blanked out uh, zoned out is often a very common phrase uh, or i've just gone away somewhere for a moment yeah any of these sort of sentence constructions but they're all movement away from the self so they don't have to think or feel or uh, get in touch with uncomfortable things yeah and you can you can see that happening in the therapy room when somebody's zoned out or yeah, I think like you say, they've gone to a, another place. Yeah. And they people learn that to do that from an unconscious place very early in their histories. Yeah. And it's to move away from the uncomfortability of reality. Yeah. And of course, people have been abused traumatized uh, ritualized or, or you know um, all these things to survive they have to move away from the trauma and so they uh, how can i explain this they actively psychologically those may those unconscious they move themselves away from their body or psychological spirit now you can teach people to dissociate other way i mean people who are in trauma situations and um all these abusive situations we've just talked about will do that as a way to survive naturally yeah they don't have to be taught that they do it yeah whereas i'm a, when i go to the to the dentist for example and i hate de dentistry and I've got coming up to have, oh, 700 pounds worth of dentistry. Wow. Of crown teeth and goodness knows what. So I look up there and above me is some uh, grids and 
different patterns wallpaper and different things like that so i can force myself to count the grids or to count the sp the spots on the wallpaper or whatever it is and i can move away i can teach myself to move away as much as i can from the uncomfortability of the reality of the pain yeah and and that's become a really well-known phenomenon in dentistry to the extent they provide the, 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 these some of these dentists dentistries do anyway they provide televisions or they provide the things you can look up which have narratives or or you can read a book or goodness knows what yeah yeah um, and it's the same thing it's to do, they make say oh to distract you but it's in our, in clinical terms it's a movement away from the pain of the reality the person is in yeah and it works being able to consciously do that in certain situations definitely and if you're being abused then what's the best way yeah move yourself from the situation yeah that's the positive side and thank god people do that other way to survive the negative side or the cost later on in life is they continue to do it mm. circumstances when they don't need to do it so much yeah they they taught themselves they've learned how to do it and any uh resemblance of the same process you know or anything that reminds them of that or triggers them up they can suddenly dissociate and then they lose their they lose their self really yeah yeah which like you say it's it's understandable it's a really good thing to do in certain situations but then the impact on the present if we're doing that unnecessarily is you know on relationships and connection with other people oh, yeah so yeah. people have been abused at many different levels and they've had to dissociate to survive and cope what can happen in later life um when they get say get involved in a healthy relationship and then sex comes up or intimacy comes up yeah um they may have flashbacks they may get triggered back to their history and it gets played out in the present so then sexual relationships can be very difficult and then dissociation can turn, occur and the other person on the end of the dissociation feels that they're not there yeah and then you've got intimacy issues communication issues and then they come to therapy yeah but defense mechanisms are like you say it's it's for survival it's you know and being vulnerable takes courage in the therapy room you, you know I, I do think the two come hand in hand in the the therapy room in yeah. order to be vulnerable and you know talk about and express these things the client has got to be really courageous to yeah. change the patterns without a doubt uh, and I'm always reminded of that I mean I watch a television program called uh just come it's been on for quite a while it goes off and then it comes back again and it's a detective program it's called professor t i think yes yeah t or q i'm not quite sure and he places the guy who was in uh, death in paradise yeah he was the first detective i can't remember his name anyway plays this eccentric sort of uh professor consultant and he solves these cases but he also has tremendous intimacy issues and he's just hired an intimacy coach um uh but what happens is that the his past which is very uh traumatic uh gets played out today in we'll say healthy relationships but he isn't able to reconnect himself so he gets triggered back into distrust to fragmentation and into intimacy because of possible yeah so he's gone into psychotherapy and i think the therapist has said get an intimacy coach so 
it's all so we, what's really important is what you've just said that was an example of what i'm talking about but what's really important is what you've just said is to to understand that these defenses are survival coping mechanisms mm. and they need to be honored yeah just dismantled yeah i love that i love the way you phrase that they do need to be honored yeah. and Not... giving gratitude and thanks because it's got the client to where they are today yeah absolutely that's where compassion needs to come in yeah another unconscious defense process is splitting some people might say fragmentation yeah it's, it's on the same ballpark of dissociation by the way movement away from the self but it's much more intense well is it more intense but it, it's it's um it's where we split off from part of ourselves and if you if you're into thinking about things like multiple personality disorder thinking about things like dissociative identity disorders uh they'll talk about the mechanism of splitting yeah uh, it's off from parts of our cells if you like and that might be people who have um felt really you know for example really guilty about themselves ashamed of themselves disgusted about themselves or what afraid now what now it is you want to use so they split off from that part of themselves and create another part yeah you might call that adaptation but it's a at a milder level yeah um that we adapt other people call imposter syndromes they're, they're all ways of um but they're all patterns by they're all part of a splitting process yeah and like um, you say there's different levels and severity to it yeah you you know imposter syndrome mm. doesn't seem that bad as you know the splitting and fragmenting but it is a similar sort of thing it's in the same ballpark because yeah. we split off and create a, a false self. Yeah. And the therapy is integration of the two. Yeah. The false self, real self. Yeah. Yeah. So splitting is an unconscious defense system. Another one would be depersonalization. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. 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 Where we, again, all they're all in the same ball part of splitting and fragmentation and moving away from the self. This is where we move away from the self as well. And we, we, how can I explain? We, person who depersonalized will talk about, well, I, I feel when I'm in situations, and of course, it's, it's, it has its triggers in a person's history. I, uh, which are traumatic for me, or I feel vulnerable in, I feel as if I'm moved away from the situation and I'm, I have no feelings. I'm just looking down at the situation. They yeah. might explain it that way. Yeah. All the unconscious defenses we're talking about here are movements away from the self so we can cope with present day reality in a different way. Yeah. So, how do we work with this in the therapy room? First step is to understand what you just said and I just said. Is that they're coping mechanisms, yeah. they're survival mechanisms. We need to honor them. We yeah. need to understand them before we go any forward or before we go anything else. If we don't do that, we may encourage a person, for example, to dismantle their defense systems. And that'd be the worst thing you could do. Yeah. The person then would suddenly be in a sort of uh, boat of, um, their history without a paddle yeah you know they'd have That's no the drift yeah 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 uh, it would be the worst thing to do so you you need to find out what drives the unconscious processes what the trauma was what the their history of uh history of injury was or whatever it, whatever we're talking about in somebody's history we need to find out what that's all about first we need to understand the context of where the defences were established first. And we need to then help the person, what I would call, normalise the situation. So they understand that these defence mechanisms are a normal reaction to yeah. this. these awful things that have happened to them. Yeah. And from that place, 
they may move to a place where they can get some compassion or a different narrative than the one they tell themselves. Yeah. And from that place, they can start then integrating perhaps the possibility of new healthy coping mechanisms. I'm not sorry, not say you, you know, you encourage them straight away to, uh, you know, dismantle their other uh, uh, processes. But if they first of all start to see this normal in the context they're talking about, they can see that this is an unconscious process. They can see that that's how they survive. They can see that, you know, they can move to some compassion and a different narrative. They might be able to see there's different ways of actually handling the situation or at least understand the connection between the two yeah yeah because you know the the, the actual clue for me is in the title the un unconscious defenses bringing it into a client's awareness that we all have defenses that is like you say from the moment we're born you know we're trying to not be vulnerable and you know live and survive so it's it's you know we all have defenses of, of one form or another and understanding that that's part of us and being aware of it for me is the first step to then like you say not dismantle it completely but to just understand that it's 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 okay and it's normal to have them yeah what you're talking about is bringing that into their awareness yeah yeah and then from that place um, helping them to, how can I explain, desensitize really to see that there might be other choices to yeah. experiment in different ways, uh, move to some sort of integration, move to a uh, more compassionate narrative, and to help them integrate different processes into life. Yeah. Into everyday life. Yeah. And, and you know, as always, it's, it's a long process with things like this, you know, because the, there is guilt and shame or potentially guilt and shame attached to it. And that negative self-talk about, you know, even just being aware that this behaviour exists, they can start to be quite negative about it as opposed to being compassionate. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Why have I always done this? Why do I always ruin every relationship I've been in? It's my fault and and all those sort of things which is part of the process of moving forward yeah so i think you're correct Our awareness is the first key yeah psychoanalysts talked about awareness being the end of the whole process a psychotherapy came along and said it's not the end of the whole process we now need to help the person integrate new ways of being in their lives um, i'd like to put something in between the middle uh besides just awareness uh i think compassion yeah getting a new narrative having being able to have support in their lives um will help them move to a different place yeah because you know compassion self-love you know self-forgiveness all those sort of things are are for me really important in the therapy process they are, and to help that happen, if you like, you have to, by definition, uh, look at their internal eye, where the, na where the negative narrative came from. Mm. Yeah. Another sort of way of people often might say, I've always been like this, you know, and, and then they start to talk about the, how, how they've hated themselves and X, 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 X. And often you see, um part of the therapy is helping them understand that 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 is not actually that those words or the narrative or the way they think isn't a, isn't an i yeah it comes these narratives come from somewhere else yeah that's half the battle if they can move you know from an i position to understand that these narratives are really from an outside source yeah and it, it it can be really difficult you know because it's like they're losing part of their identity when they're 
unearthing all of this stuff you know they I thought this is who I always was and when we start to understand like you said that that narrative comes from outside and and you know it's not authentically who we are one it's a wonderful thing but also it's part of losing and letting something go as well which can be really you know quite a big thing in therapy oh it's massive i mean you're absolutely correct and i think that um i think it's a process yeah never be an event can it yeah and there's a sense of loss with it when we we put something down and we you know move forward or like you say we integrate and become a, a different person there's a sense of grief and loss that goes along with that yeah and of course dealing with the shame and guilt is yeah. which always raises its head yeah so all the time it does it does for me <laughs> it is a really other process but i think the starting point is how can be aware of these unconscious defense systems and secondly the normality of it yeah and how they had to survive that way and even though it might be difficult now and even though we might have to understand and hopefully change things it was normal back then and they're not crazy yeah because often people move to a place and think of themselves as crazy or eccentric or unusual or not normal or all these place things but actually that's actually really um has come from somewhere else yeah we need to help them understand all that and help them move to a, a kind of framework about themselves rather than this um harsh position they often take which again i, I just repeat in this podcast is somewhere they've taken from somewhere else yeah i often it's surprising. I was just thinking as you were talking then how often it actually comes up in in the therapy room. Is you know, I often talk about the little you. Mm. <laughs> you know, the, the little you did the best that they could with the resources that they had available at the time. And you need to be, you know, show empathy and gratitude to that. But now as an adult, you've got, you know, the wherewithal and more resources and the resilience to do something different. But you've got to, like you said early on in this podcast, you've got to honour that little you. And how you got by. Yeah. The miss of the tremendous trauma and toxicity and personal injury that maybe uh, was part of your life back there. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, that's, that's true. And... I often find, of course, that when often when, when people, either through visualization or aggression or or whatever mechanism we talk about, are able to get in touch with their younger self, they usually, and I don't know if this is your experience, very harsh on themselves. Mm. Yeah. And the more traumatic, punitive, abusive history the person's had, the harsher they are. Yeah which means that the level of abuse is more extreme. And I think that's really important for a therapist to take into account because then what you need to think about is protection for that uh, inner child that the person is now starting to um, unearth. Yeah. So I use high nurturing channel when I talk to um, or help a person get touch with the younger self i think it was a podcast either the one last one or the one before when we were talking about inner child yeah um uh, but it's in the same ballpark uh that you need you need to use a nurturing child and you need to provide protection yeah the unconscious defense systems to help them understand that their defense systems are product of survival and to be honoured is imperative. Yeah. I think it's a duty of a therapist to help the person come to that awareness. Yeah. And, you know, those defences will show up in the therapy room. They'll be using all their defences when we get close to something with us, you know, and like... 
Yeah, absolutely. In TA, we talk about drivers and trying hard and being strong and being perfect and all uh -huh. these things that people aren't aware that they're doing. But of course, they're driven that way to survive. Yeah. If I don't, I don't know, if I'm not pleased with people, then I'll get um, hit. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I'm going to make damn sure that I'm going to get on and in a way which isn't traumatic to me. Yeah. And again, like everything, there's layers to it. Like you said, the drivers and the please others, the, the, you know, the, the client might say and do things to, you know, placate us or keep us happy and, you know, veer us away from something that they feel uncomfortable with. So it's it's like a, a barrage of, of defences all the time. Oh, all the time. And mainly there to keep us away from yeah. the relationship with them. Yeah. In some form or other yeah so it's slow and steady rings wins the race it's not going in with a battery yeah. ram yeah another defense system we haven't mentioned what talking about um but i can bring up it is displacement so we, more. well it's in the area of distraction but it's to uh move away from the subject yeah we displace it onto the other so uh, uh the original trauma is about x but then we um put it onto the other person we displace it that's what i'm saying yeah start um talking thinking feeling about the other rather than talking feeling think about us yeah so it suddenly becomes the other process the other person's process or whatever it is blame yeah, yeah. Talk about um so that we don't have to deal with or take ownership of the vulnerable self when we project or blame or attack or any of these displacement activities. They're all parts of surviving. Yeah. Traumatic situations. As human beings, I know we're very complex, but there's a system in place. Mm, yeah. yeah. Which is is quite comforting really <laughs> yeah. it's not a conscious thing that we have all these defenses we don't think you know consciously right i need to defend against this we just do it somehow for survival oh. i remember talking to somebody a client years and years ago and he was describing a traumatic situation where he he got his uh what was he driving a forklift truck i think and he was going too fast and he caught his the forklift truck or whatever it is on the fence and pulled the fence down and the forklift truck went over and then the um boss came over and shouted and to him see what you've done and he, he the guy looked up and said was that me yeah that's denial yeah protect himself from the wrath of the other and move away from ownership, of course, but basically is to protect himself from the perceived wrath of the other person. Now, if the person rushed up and said, are you okay? Are you okay if you hurt yourself? Then there might have been a different reaction. I don't know, because yeah. I don't know. Yeah. He, he might have been reacting to trauma of the past rather than the forklift in the current situation. I don't know. But I do know that the denial was an instant survival reaction from perceived wrath yeah in the book yeah which you can imagine a young child doing that do you know what i mean if if we've done something wrong whether it's an accident or whatever we we do everything we can to try and evade capture so to speak or if get away history, with it. yeah right if your history has been regular occurrences of these types of uh punitive transactions yeah. then when that supervisor rushes up and you know shouts at you then it's it's a trigger to all these other traumas yeah, yeah. promotes this type of response it's not necessarily the one current transaction yeah. and it may be but it usually isn't yeah. it's usually the style where those are conscious and conscious defense systems have been utilized many times over 
to escape the wrath of the perceived other. Yeah. We are a product of our upbringing and our past. And, you know, again, it's just what you said then about all the other sequence of events, it, you know, that that's putting it, you know, in a, a visual representation for me that our, pe our past affects our present 100% of the time. Hmm. So a client comes in the door and is late five minutes uh, and you say to him, oh, there's many transactions, but say, say you said, I don't know, I, don't, I can't imagine a third say that, but they might say it this way. Uh, they may say, oh, you're late, aren't you? Not in a particularly punitive way, but if the person, if the clients had many, 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 many experiences which have been punitive, punitive or toxic by a another person who's been out to hurt them, then they will project that onto the comment from the therapist even if it was from their adult ego state yeah they will put a project unconsciously the punitive parent onto the therapist and they'll act accordingly yeah. they'll close down they'll withdraw or do they do what they did in many situations before to survive the wrath of the perceived other yeah and will that that will then enact history for them, but will provide stability, a consistent identity, a stable level of stability of script, and how life actually works. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because, you, you know, I, I would imagine if a client has got that history and they do turn up late, that they're already in that process before they've even walked in through the door. Yeah, because they will be perceiving and projecting what the therapist, and they will expect the therapist go to go to a punitive parental, yeah, like all the other people in front of them. E and so then when they walk in, even if the person's coming from a an adult position, they will already be moving to an unconscious yeah. system, which again is something. You know, as a, a therapist, to just be mindful and aware of, you know, the therapy starts before they even walk in through the door with what's happened to them and, you know, the situation that they're in in that moment. It's it's starting outside the therapy room. Oh, absolutely. So it takes a long time to actually establish a th positive therapeutic relationship and trust between therapist and client because of the levels of unconscious defenses and projections that occur between the client and the therapist. Yeah. For a lot of the time, especially with the very disturbed clients, they don't actually have a relationship with the therapist in the here and now. Mm. They are having relationships with their projected parents. Yeah. And it takes quite a lot of skill by the therapist and patience to stay with that. Patience, I think, is a good word for it. Yeah. The, low, the higher level of disturbance a person has, the more redefinitions and projections that the client will have and the more patience a therapist will need. Yeah. And it's not a one-hit wonder. It's replaying it over and over and over again to to loosen the hold of the defense mechanisms oh. they're going to be laying traps they're going to be testing they're going to be doing this over and over which you know that patience is is needed yeah, um, yeah. it's like at the moment um the race for space has increased again so a lot of money has been spent on you know um launches are into mars i was still there was another one coming up and this that the other and they're going to put the man men on the moon again now if you can imagine this if your client has come from the moon or an a a completely different type of world they will expect the world to be like the world they inhabited before yeah so they will transact in a way behave in a way and feel in a way that they did in their previous inhabitation 
Why? To provide psychological identity, to provide psychological stability, to provide um, a sense of continuity and to show themselves that the, this is how the world runs. Yeah. If, if they don't do that, uh, then they start to feel very uncomfortable and don't really understand why this world isn't acting in a similar way to the other world. Yeah. And like you said earlier on in this, that leaves them adrift because there isn't an anchor. There's nothing There's nothing that they can hang on to, to a certain extent. Oh. Yeah. So if you can stay with them, the therapist will become the anchor. Yeah. But it's a process. Yeah. And the, a therapist needs to understand or at least have the passion and motivation and curiosity to attempt to understand the other world that the client inhabits so they can provide the bridge between the two worlds. What a wonderful way to finish this podcast, Bob, as a bridge between two worlds. Yeah, no, I really mean that. And, yeah. uh, it's something I've endeavoured to do throughout my world, throughout my practices and the decades of of work I've done to provide a bridge between these two different, completely different worlds or you know places that often people inhabit when they come to see me for therapy. Yeah. Because then I can maybe provide you know uh, a more healthy path for their uh, being in life. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a process, never an event. No, I use that's that saying a lot doing. as well. That's what you've been doing for the last however many years, um, and I've only I've been humble to do it. Yeah. I've been been a privilege in my life. Yeah, and it is you know to a certain extent, I suppose, as well as that bridge, it's been that constant object, you know, yeah. that that they can yeah. rely on, come hell or high water. <laughs> that you, you're not going to, you know, abandon them or be scared of them or they're not going to overwhelm you or be too much for you and all those sort of things that that often clients think. Yeah, and I, I'll go back, I know, as this podcast is about unconscious defences, I think you're completely right. If you help the person be aware of their unconscious defences as healthy mechanisms for coping and surviving, then you will help them find the bridge or the be able to take you in terms of object constancy so they can find an, a way out of their hell yeah and i'm sure you're held in a lot of people's hearts and minds bob with the people that you've seen as a constant object and what will bob say what will bob do <laughs> yeah and, and I, I, i'm very humbled and proud in terms of my profession and you know um i suppose that has got me through the decades of the work i've done mm. and you yeah i i i love my job i love what i do yeah so thank you for allowing me to talk about conscious defense systems. as always bob you're welcome we have no idea what we're doing next time so it'll be a surprise for everybody <laughs> um i yeah, we can say it again next next time we'll surprise people and we'll go back to giving them a sense of predictability and a sense of structure and what the next two will be but anyway you're quite right we don't know at this moment but they will be uh fascinating uh things i'm sure to discuss i completely agree until next time bob thank you thank you bye 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 you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode